not only got better, they were doing something <coughs> division, and I'm, I'm good at you know, jumping through that. Not only did their, did their field of view increase, but there was an associated uh, increase in the fMRI, uh, and that's the difference pre and post. Uh, and it was curious that the difference pre and post correlated where the models thought the current was going. Um, and we have reasons to believe why this is not coincidental. Um, Beyond the science, I just wanted to point out that technically, you can now co-register modeling data with any functional data. So if you have fMRI, so that, that you can put them into the same space and you can make comparisons between current flow and functional. So you can use the functional prospectively, as I showed you before, to pick your target, but you can also, if you're doing functional in real time, you can track that against where the current flow is going, but you need to do this on a subject-specific basis or else it's not going to make any sense. Um, uh, okay, do you want to be focal? I mean, do you even care, right? Because I showed you you could be. Um, the vast majority of clinical trials uh, with TDCS and other experiments with TDCS used distance sponge pads and they did not have focality. The huge weight of the, the precedence is on non-focal stimulation. Uh, and so, given that, um, do you want to be focal? And I think it's very, you can separate out that question into, you know, is this in clinical management or clinical research, you know, towards with that goal, or is this in cognitive neuroscience where it's used as a, you know, neuromodulatory tool? Uh, in the second case, I think the, the issue is pretty much resolved. Yes, uh, if you put pads here and you see an effect on some cognitive task, and then you submit that paper and say you modulated the anterior lobe of the whatever this your paper's going to be rejected, right? You did not. You stimulated half the brain and the deep brain structures and this and that. In clinical modulation, I think it's an open question. Um, uh, but I'll show you some reasons why you might think about it. Um, the notion of being folk, wanting to be focal is not, is, is always been around because when you talk about um, deep brain stimulation or vagus nose stimulation, the whole rationale for this the reason you would drill a hole in someone's skull is to be focal, and you plant the lectures next to it. And transcranial magnetic stimulation, right, uh, which is like the brawnier older cousin or something of TDCS, right, uh, is considered to be targeted. And it's considered targeted because, quote unquote, the skull is transparent to magnetic stimulation. But regardless, people were very enthusiastic that TMS was to be targeted. And that's why we tend to use figure of eight coils and not circular. Now, TDCS is not targeted when you do it with huge sponge pads. But when you optimize it, you, you can be targeted. And so in that sense, you just think about it superficially, you know, it's almost like why not, uh, given that you, you, you can do it this way. Um, well, first of all, you need hardware, right? So um, this just shows you what high definition hardware looks like. There's different companies that make it now. Uh, this is again the one I work with, so I have their pictures. Uh, it, that looks a lot like an EEG cap with electrodes in it. It is an EEG cap with electrodes in it. Uh, the only difference is that these electrodes um, are specially designed um, to allow passage of DC current in a tolerated way. So if you took regular EEG electrodes and you put two milliamps through them for 20 minutes, you generate yourself a very nice burn. And so. Um, you cannot use EEG electrodes, you need to use these high definition electrodes, but it's fine, you just get them. Uh, but it's very important because I wouldn't want someone to like cut a sponge in half or something and say, oh, I've got a burn. Well, that's because you didn't, there are prescriptions for how to do this. There's prescriptions for how to do TDCS and there's prescriptions to do high TDCS and I'm very uh, uncomfortable um, in both cases where people go off prescription. Um, and then there have been some clinical trials uh, and they've been working out pretty good, uh, but everything in TDCS works, right? That's what we, we know that. So I don't you know, but it's nice to know that this works too, but there's some interesting things that make it different than TDCS, and this is interesting to me. Uh, and so I'll show you, I guess just one example, I don't know if I have any more slides on this, but this was done, a study that was done by uh, Nietzsche and Paulus. They published a seminal 2000 paper. And what they did in that seminal 2000 paper, and Alvaro just alluded to this, I'm sure you heard about it this morning, is they put an anode or a cathode over motor cortex. 
And when they put an anode over motor cortex and stimulated for a while, when they took the anode off and applied TMS, they found out that you know, the finger twitched more, that the MEP went up as compared to pre-stimulation. And that's what you see in the purple trace. So the purple trace is conventional anodal. And by conventional, I mean the regular TDCS, which looks like this. And conventional anodal, in this, in this, this is a crossover study. So in this, these particular subjects, they had a 60% increase in excitability compared to control. And after uh, within two hours, um, that returned to baseline. And with conventional cathodal, they saw the same thing. Now this group repeated this experiment using a, a 4x1 montage. So here's the center electrode, and here's the outer ones. And you can make the center an anode, or you can make the center a cathode. If you make the center an anode, I showed you this is a primary excitatory region. If you make the center a cathode, this is a primary inhibitory region. And what they found, um, uh, and this was not, this is published with more subjects, but the, 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 you know, the trace has not changed so much. The first thing they found was immediately after stimulation, if you looked at 4X1 anode, which is the circle, or 4X1 cathode, which is the triangle, there was no statistically significant effect relative to baseline. The MEP amplitude had not changed. But fortunately, as part of their experiment, they track out, right, because they want to see how long it lasts. At 30 minutes, and around 30 minutes, they saw a statistically significant effect with the 4X1. And moreover, they claimed that this effect was larger, statistically, on average, across subjects, than what you would see with conventional anodal. And then they found out that when they were tracking out to two hours, these points were still not statistically, were still statistically different than control. So they had to go beyond uh, two hours uh, and go out for six hours. And this is pretty striking because this is a pretty low dose. This is a single session of 10 minutes. And they went out for over two hours. And so this time course uh, was very different than TDCS. Um, but it wasn't, at least to me, it wasn't shocking because the other hat I wear is I do animal physiology and I do DC stimulation on animals. Um, and as far as the kind of processes that need to activate to induce things that you know, in the animal literature will call long-term potentiation and long-term depression, these do not turn on always like a switch. This machinery takes time, often around 30 minutes. So this actually made a lot of sense to me. And so it's not just about being more full. I think that the effects that you may, and, and Alvaro talked about how much more complicated this can get with behavioral interventions and timing, and you do 10 minutes before and wait 10 minutes and then do the behavior, or 20 minutes and start. I mean, there's many, many permutations. And, and here's another one, and I'm very biased, and you know, this, this has been around for 10 years longer than this. You know, I don't interpret this in the context of that. I interpret this in the context of this. This is focal stimulation, relatively focal stimulation of the motor regions for 10 minutes, and this is what it does. Now, when you stimulate the motor region and half the brain, you get these other effects that are due to these other regions, like you know, whatever it is, different thalamic nuclei, everything, right? All these fibers being stimulated, a lot is being activated in this case, leading to these changes. And so, um, you know, if you're gonna set, if, if the goal is to set up a, you know, a clinical treatment program uh, for pain right now, you know what I mean? Uh, this is new enough. Uh, that there may be a, a basis to just stick with what is known. Um, though certainly we have results now on this for pain, and we think they're larger than, than for this, but just rationally speaking, you know, moving forward, and I'm very biased, you know, I think there's a real reason to, in, in parallel, look at focality and look at these focal montages. I almost feel at this point, like if you're not doing it, you're almost deliberately not doing it because it's out there. And it's fine to deliberate not do it. You may say, look, I'm, I'm treating depression, and this is what's been working for depression. There's a multi-center trial now on for depression, and they're using conventional TCS. And I think that makes sense for the field to move in that direction. Uh, but that trial, absolutely, and we're working with that group, does not presume that they're stimulating the brain focally in any sense of it, in any sense of it. They know what they're doing. So they're cognizant of this issue. And so, um, that's sort of it with the high definition. Again, the, the, um, 
have a conflict of interest, right? Because there's a commercial entity and they'll be here tomorrow. I don't know if they're going to be shown in high definition. Um, and it's not about two paths, right? Um, it's about an array. And you don't need to use all the array, but you can. 4x1 is one montage, but the, it's wide open. I showed you 4x2, 6x6. You want to start the deep structures. Once you move away from the pads and you start thinking about electrodes like this, you have many, many more permutations, and your power, it just, it just will automatically increase. Of course, you can do more. Whether or not you want to or not is a different story. And, and fortunately, uh, a lot of the, te the technologies there, and also with software that's available, I talked about this notion of picking a target and getting the best possible montage. Well, that's there as well, and, and they'll demonstrate that. So if you have a target of interest, um, you can see how well you can do with conventional TDCS and how well you can do with, with high definition. And um, um, you know, it's great to see more people adopting this technique. I mean, I think, as far as the physics go, TDCS is sort of like the opposite of the EEG. It really is. You know, it's the same kind of thing, but the current is either coming <coughs> out or in. Certainly, you do not do EEG anymore with sponge pads. I think they probably used to, right? But they don't do that anymore, not, not at least for the, for the more state-of-the-art approaches. And they certainly don't, wouldn't do EEG with a sponge pad and claim that they're recording from the pre-mortar region. Uh, and so the categorical difference between doing EEG with sponge pads versus EEG with electrodes applies for stimulation as well. It gives you something else. That, it doesn't mean you're always going to want it. There's, the sponge pads are really easy to set up. They're cheap. It's really convenient, you know what I mean? There's a huge advantage to that, and that's why people love TDCS, because it's so easy to do. And this, it will always be a little bit harder, because you have four electrodes to set up, or six electrodes. Um, and so, with high definition, I think there's a lot of reasons why you might be thinking about it. Um, you can hit multiple targets uh, for susceptible populations, and by that I mean skull defects and kids. Uh, there are additional advantages. Uh, because it's a more consistent approach, uh, uh, there are also better shams. Uh, there are sham, however mentioned the sham problems with regular TDCS. With high definition, it's really easy. You just put the two electrodes right next to each other, and all the current just passes between them. And even experienced investigators cannot tell the difference between that you know, and a 4X1. So it's a really nice sham. Maybe you don't want it, but it's there. Um, Everything I showed you, I'm not actually going to get into this, but everything, well, everything I showed you was with these computer models. Every single pretty picture I've shown you was a prediction, not a recording and not a measurement. But we've spent a lot of time over the past few years validating that those pictures represent what's going on in reality. Um, but I'm not going to, you know, I'm not, I have some slides on that, but those, those papers are also on, on, on the website, but I, I I think that's a very, everything I've said is predicated on these, on these little pictures being correct, right? And so we spent a lot of time thinking about are they correct? When we first started this work, especially with the large pads, we got a lot of pushback because people didn't want to necessarily hear it. Uh, and this was a big question that came up, so we, it was very important that we did it. Uh, but we've done stuff like, um, well, I'll show you one because it was really crazy. I have to show this one. We, I didn't do this. Um, the people in Germany, the same people who came up with um, uh, TDCS, uh, decided to do TDCS on dead people. And they also decided to do TDCS people in a magnet conducting fMRI. So they were looking for functional changes in dead people as a result of TDCS. A really interesting experiment. And I really uh, am not sure why they were doing it right at the time. <coughs> And they saw a signal, and they didn't know what to do with it. And so they sat on it, and they visited them. And they showed me these pictures, and they're like, we're getting the signal. We don't know what it is. And I said, well, I know what it is, because I think about this all the time. That's current flow. That's exactly where the current flow should be. It's not under the electrodes. It's between the electrodes. It's not so much in the brain. It's in the CSF. And it's in deep structures. And if you look, and they did, it's in the skin. It's exactly where you think it should be. It reverses perfectly with polarity, and no the cathode, with the direction switches. And so we did a side-by-side -side comparison, individualized modeling in dead people, 
It's not really fMRI anymore, it's something else, right? But these are the magnetic signatures associated with current flow because as the current flow through the head, it generates a magnetic field because current generates a magnetic field. And that magnetic field is picked up by the scanner and the scanner gets confused. But that confusion is to our benefit because then the scanner projects it in this way when you use the fMRI algorithms, which happen to be super, super optimized for sensitivity. Uh, and so visualizing it in this way and comparing it to the models uh, and seeing actually things that were maybe even a little bit unintuitive, but hence correct. Uh, like if you have an electrode here and an electrode here, the peak is not under this electrode, it's in between. And that's what's shown in, in both cases. Um, helped us convince ourselves that we're not crazy. Yeah. So you can't really do fMRI and it seems like very little. So th this is something, you know, I, I uh, right. Well, you can, but you need to be cognizant of the issues. So when people talk about compatible, when people talk about fMRI compatible TDCS, what does that mean? What do they mean by that? I mean, the one thing they mean is you're not going to die, and you're not going to have a seizure. But beyond that, right, just because you have a CE mark for that does not mean anything. And never mind the fact that you, I'm not even getting to the fact that you have large loops inside a scanner. And same thing, changing magnetic field is going to induce current in that. And so I think you need to be very, the thing is, once you know this is true, it's very easy to correct for it. Right? It's not like it's hard to correct for. Uh, but um, if you do not, if you're not aware of it, then you need to be very careful. I just talked to someone about stimulation with EEG. I, think, I don't think there's a big problem there, but there are steps that you can do. If there are, if, so when you're talking about correct, combining it <coughs> with a measure like that, I think you need to be aware of the potential interaction. Once you know it, though, you can ideally just subtract it out. So the nice thing about this, for example, is if you, really, if you want to measure this, you just turn the stimulation on, off, on, off, on, off, on, off. This is an instant signal. It responds within a microsecond. So you, you could pick it up right away. You know it's not real fMRI, and assuming that that's linear with what you're measuring, you could just drop it out. And so, but it's, you're, it's a very good point. I think the studies prior to this, uh, included by this group, so they were, you know, they were upfront about it, uh, you need to be careful in how, you know, as a political way to say, they should be careful in how, they, how they've analyzed their data. Right? Because this will, and again, this will be montage specific, this will be polarity specific, all those controls, when you have, when you have, when you have these interactions, don't take care of it. Oh, you say it's montage specific. Well, that, that's the artifacts, so is the artifact. Um, all right, so maybe that was a lot to digest after a long day of hearing stuff. If there's any questions, and I think I, I know if we're, it's time to start the next talk, actually. So, okay.